as you all know, the theme tonight, beginning again, practicing for joyful, joyful regeneration and renewal. The subtitle or the back end of the title that didn't make it to the promo was in still troubled times, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> we know that's true, right? That's, like, that's the backdrop of so much right now. And I really want to name that. We're, we're recognizing the trouble and the struggle. But we're also inviting a sense of what is it within us that keeps on keeping on, as my grandmother would say, right? Or that makes a way out of no way, as she would also say. What, what are some of the sayings that come up for you that the ancestors, the wisdom keepers in your history and family, the strong ones without whom we wouldn't be here. What are some of the ways they remind you of what you already know deep in your bones, deep in your being about what it takes to, to begin again? All of us, I think, at this moment are maybe looking at beginning again through obviously different lenses. What are we beginning again? What does the invitation to begin again look like to you? I think again, whenever we come together, even you know, if we're speaking the same language or goodness, even if we're in the same family with our <laughs> the people we were brought into the world with, so many different experiences are in the room. So many different points of view are always in the room. And so that's definitely true when we're here. And we're coming together around this circle, in this circle, at this time. October 21st, 2021, a time of, um, whew, we're in the strong, the, the storm, if you will, continuing storm of what feels like a storm anyway for me of all the different pandemics that interlock. So income inequality and all kinds of different sorts of violence that are always sort of pervasive, but are that, that have been concentrated and made worse in some senses, especially income inequality by this period of the pandemic. But the pandemic itself has made us all feel much more vulnerable and we have lost friends and family, whether to the virus itself, whether to life circumstances, they moved, right? The, the communities that we have cultivated are not the same today for many of us, if not most of us, as they were 18 months ago. So I will speak for myself. You know, one of my best friends is still my best friend, but uh, no longer living close to me in the Bay Area for a variety of reasons. Um, that started with too long in the isolation of the coronavirus and needing to be closer to people that weren't here. So friends, loved ones, um, not just moved, but again, we know that the lethality of this time and all times, right? The lethality, the violence, the difficulties that we face as brown, black, indigenous, um, Asian, Pacific Islander, right, BIPOC from the whole ocean. <laughs> we know we face, face heightened degrees of vulnerability just by being. And certainly that's been the case with the coronavirus. So as we prepare in so many ways to, or continue, right, to restart, some of us are traveling again or We've gone back to work in person. 
or we're starting new relationships because again, these relationships that we started the pandemic with are not the ones we're gonna be moving through the next phase with. Beginning again, what's the relationship of our practice commitments to that? What's the relationship of being in Sangha to that? Creating a community of support and staying with that. I'll say, you know, I wrote a book a few years ago that was focused on bringing mindfulness to bear on the work of addressing racial injustice more effectively, right? The inner work of racial justice, and you may be familiar with it. And, you know, one of the things I realized, the subtitle of the book, by the way, is Healing Ourselves and transforming our communities through mindfulness, healing ourselves. So, you know, I've been teaching law, actually, as many of you may know, for more than 20 years. I've been practicing law before that. And, um, and along the way, I've been deepening my own commitment to meditation, to the teachings of the Buddha, and trying to survive these times and all the changes and, you know, including racism, sexism, and all the intersections, um, which being a lawyer didn't protect me from, being a law prof professor didn't protect me from. I was teaching these classes around racism in our history. Um, you know, well before anybody was up in arms talking about critical race theory out there. We were having these classes and we were looking at critical race theory and the history that made um, something called critical race theory emerge, right? The history of racism um, in law. Looking at that with groups of students from different backgrounds, semester after semester, Every you know year, as I you know, went into my second year of teaching, third, fourth, I started to feel more how important it was for me to have practices to ground ground myself in, to support me in being able to stay in those conversations and to bring new people into conversation. You know, so all of the different ways that the broader culture, many people in the broader culture, were just waking up to the challenges of self education and co-education around our histories, around racism and injustice, including the miseducation and the discovered ignorance and all that, right? We were dealing with that stuff in my classes. And I was leaning more and more into my practices. And at a certain point, I was like, I kind of need to bring in what I'm doing to help me be able to hold these classes, right? Bring in compassion, bring in pausing, bring in the invitation for people to tell their stories. Who are we when we come around these tables and read these cases? When we talk about this thing called race and racism, what does that really mean from our experience? What does it mean in our family experiences? So putting those books down and letting the group teach from their life experiences and infusing that with compassion. Um, you know, so that journey began 2004 or so. So we're almost at 20 years on the experiment of supporting people in deeper dives, looking at what we know about race and racism from our own experience and supporting us all the way through with these kinds of practices, but it seemed like healing has been called for throughout. So much pain that we all know, and so much um, frustration, anxiety, grief. So 
the healing part means a lot to me in all of this. And um, I don't think of healing as anything that can be done overnight, in fact, especially around these issues of social identity-based bias, whether it's about race or, or the way that race intersects with all the other isms and schisms to cause us pain. I don't believe that healing just sort of happens or that it will necessarily happen in a way that we can celebrate, you know, in one moment, like we're done. It may be that it's a lifelong challenge to heal, but I can share that um, some of the, along the way I've look, been looking at myself, sharing, listening to others, and I want to invite your wisdom. What is healing? What has healing been like for you? And how have you learned something about healing and beginning again? over the last 18 months? Have we learned something about the challenges, the difficulty, the depth of what we're up against? I think I'm certain I have. In the two years since this book came out, I've had hundreds and hundreds of gatherings with people, university folk, people, all community advocates, you hear a lot of interest in these top in this topic of racial justice since the George Floyd public killing. And yet, hmm, there's a lot of performativity out there. There's a lot of let's just invite this person in to talk about racial justice to check it off, check off a box to say we did that. Right? There's or there's a lot of I thought we already, you know had dealt with that. So of course, one thing I'm learning is just again, what I've, what I've seen over the years, this is lifelong work, lifelong. What else am I learning? I'm learning that as um, now I'm gonna draw on one of the teachers that I referenced in this book is a teacher from South Africa. Um, that I was privileged to meet on a trip to South Africa a few years ago. And, um, you know, he so beautifully kind of got us thinking about, you know, how big <laughs> the work that we were coming to do. We were gathering in South Africa, and it was um, a conference on mindfulness in an African context. And this teacher, Baba Mendaza Kadimwa, you know, beautiful, bit of an elder of mine, of ours, you might say, who, who, who said, you know what, Y'all, he asked us, do you really understand why you're here? You're talking about mindfulness in a South African context. First of all, what is this thing you're calling Africa and South Africa? What are the divisions that you have in your mind when you think about this place called Africa relative to wherever you've come from? Heal those. Heal the separations, he said, first and foremost. And we're going to talk about mindfulness and justice. Heal the separations. So when I think about beginning again, I naturally now think about what are the places that are disconnected that I need to stitch back together? And it looks as though when I look at other scholars who have studied what healing means, integrating, reconnecting, feeling ourselves a part of something seems to be a really important part to whatever the healing aspect of beginning again might be. So reconnecting, stitching together the worlds that seem disconnected, integrating, feeling the interdependence, interconnectedness of all things, healing the separations, as Baba Kadimla said, be like the ocean that refuses no river, he said to us, which can be very, very hard when we felt a lot of things. It's like, do we really want to? No, there's some things we want to refuse, right? This is a hard one. 
that this South African elder presented to us. You know, on this side of the anti-apartheid struggle and this side of creating a new nation out of that rubble. Many, many elders there were speaking about how they hadn't dreamed big enough about, the, about what the revolution would give, like what the healing would require. So, so dreaming big in ways that make real the possibility of a, a lived sense of healing separations. So that's one piece. Something about the ongoing effort to connect, to stitch together, to heal. And again, heal in the sense of feeling ourselves a part of something um, connected. That's going to look different for each of us. All right. And what does that mean for you? Second element that I see when I've been looking at research around what healing looks like and how that can support us in the beginning of them. Telling a new story, meaning we certainly need a new story of what it means to be alive in a multiracial democracy. The old story has faltered. Yeah, thank you for posting me. Uh, more of Baba Kadema's teachings. That old story, and I've already been alluding to it a little bit, right? Whatever the story is of our separatedness, it's true to a degree. We've got our isolated individual agency and power, each of us, our groups, our communities, and we're part of a whole. So what's the new story that includes our own power power with each other in ways that support the thriving of this planet, right? So this is weaving together interconnectedness and the sense of a story of who we are that can help us heal. And then the last piece, I think I've also been alluding to, for me, I grew up in the South. I grew up with a grandmother who had been called to the Christian ministry as a teacher and had um, a daily practice of getting up before dawn, centering prayer for her. It wasn't meditation, it wasn't mindfulness, it was prayer-based, but every morning before dawn and centering on her value and her worth. So definitely for me too, centering on my value, my worth, as a daily practice, movement, walking, breathing, and feeling the aliveness, and my inherent belonging on the earth. That's a part of what healing has looked like for me during this difficult period. And it's a daily practice. So what are some of the things that are helping you heal and be ready to begin again? What does beginning again look like for you? Sometimes beginning again may look like pausing. By the way, I'm pausing from my university job for a year. I'm on academic leave after 22 years teaching and a sabbatical here and a sabbatical there. Because if nothing else this moment has said to me, we all need to, if we can afford it, if we can do it, if we can make it work at all, pausing is called for. A lot of what we've been doing just needs to be disrupted. It's not working for the planet. As we all know, it's not working for us. So I really am in this period of like pausing to see what the beginning again looks like. Not all of us can do that, but maybe more of us can do that than we admit to ourselves some kind of hard pause before we start again. I know a lot of us have felt like we paused enough during the virus and we now need to get back going. But whatever is true for you, listen to that truth. Listen to that truth. So what have you learned during this period? 
about what healing requires, about what beginning again requires for you. And how have your practices helped? I will lastly say that restarting practice is something that I've been hearing about from folks. So many people are saying, I got introduced to mindfulness in a way that didn't have a body component, right? It wasn't about healing the body. Or I got introduced to mindfulness in a way that didn't address social issues. And so many people are saying, I'm trying to find another place, places like this one, where we can actually have real talk about the things that we're dealing with and the way our practices can support us and the limits of that. There are limits. I will tell you there have been days during this period where sitting on the cushion would not work. Lying down helped and talking to people that I knew I you know I knew had my back, I knew I could trust, I knew loved me. Then after maybe several conversations and just dancing and shaking stuff off, then maybe I could meditate, yoga, qigong. But sometimes it's talking to people that I know I can trust, dancing. So what have been the ways that you have managed to put yourself in the position to begin again? And then what are the ways you're struggling? How can this community be of greater support? Any thoughts, reflections, questions? Feel free to raise a hand or put a thought in the chat, something you've learned that you want to share. We want your wisdom here. We know it's here. Or something that you are working with. What's coming up for you as you think about these things? Pausing to invite you all to share a little bit again, whether in chat. Let's see if I can open up. In chat or raise a hand, swimming in the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> swimming in the ocean. Yeah. Riding the waves. I was out at one of the oceans recently, Funston. Fort Funston over here in San Francisco and saw somebody out there in the cold wave surfing. One lone person <laughs> riding the waves, letting them come. A metaphor for so much. Touching into the fear and grief that comes with the big transformations and upheavals of me. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> what a beginning. Fear and grief. Thank you for naming that. Um, I don't know if we're the only couple here and who else is here may have felt some fear, <laughs> some grief. Of course we are feeling fear and grief at this time. Letting go of expectations, returning to journaling practice. Yes, I have a journal here. I always have a journal somewhere. <laughs> journaling practice going for walks or bike rides with no destination. Forgive me if you hear me spontaneously erupt with hallelujah, because as I said, I grew up with a Christian teacher in the house. So when I hear something that I want to uplift, I will hallelujah. Yes, going for walks with no destination. Being okay with not knowing. Mountain biking in the trees as a family, yeah. And yeah, feeling part of a global collective experience. Learned that healing happens in community and not in isolation. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Being vulnerable in community, being held. Oh my goodness, proper sleep. Yes. Yes. How many of us have been sleep, you know, found a way to reconnect with your own rhythms during some of this time that we have paused? Maybe we haven't all been able to pause during the pandemic, but if you have, were you able to connect a little bit, learning from butterfly medicine, going into the cocoon, going through it in there and emerging slowly, beautiful. Yeah. Remembering my elders' affirmations through the years. Yeah, on sleep. 
we're all like, can we really get some sleep and rest? Rediscovering relationship with body. Yeah. And health beyond surveillance and criticism. I love that. Yeah. Feeling spaciousness, feeling the goodness of your body, the perfectly okayness of your body as it is. Yeah. <laughs> Going with the large urban tree or connect with the large urban trees. Yeah. Swimming in the ocean to begin again. Mm. Being grateful for my problems. That's big. Anybody want to share? Grateful for your problems. I'd love to open it up if anybody wants to share a little bit into the group. Raise a hand or unmute. I love this. How many of us have felt some gratitude a little bit for the problems we have? Hmm, that's big. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the problems are teaching us things. You know, struggling with racism in academic environments and business environments, et cetera, diversity, equity training. It's teaching me some things about my work versus other people's work. About, um, again, I didn't create racism. And I knew this going in, but it's good to be reminded the problem of trying to, you know, to support anti-racist activism and advocacy and change work is a problem that, can, that I'm grateful for because it's helped me to see phew, I already belong. I didn't create racism. <laughs> I will help support others as they work with it. It's not mine. I'm here to love and feel the joy of being alive with you. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm saying. I love Plum Village's app. It's not a paid advertisement. Collective listening. Yeah, and a meal. Absolutely. Hallelujah to that one. As a teacher, I work a teacher I work with reminds our students that mistakes are gifts. Yes. Opportunities to learn and begin again. Yes, we already belong. We already belong. So yeah, we can, we will do the work to try to make the world a better place. We will try to make things more equitable. But as Alice Walker taught us, don't miss the color purple as we do this work. Don't miss the beauty of our lives as we do this work, of every moment as best we can. I know that the moments are not always easy. But if we can remember that we were not born to struggle, we know this. You know we weren't born to struggle, right? And that's why we come together to feel the love and the sense that we already belong. That there is, you know, there are these places where we can come together and feel ourselves in love and connection with others. So I want to, um, as we get ready to close here, I want to pause and invite, yes, chants and practices for some reason are inviting me to want to open up to a practice of like humming together, which I do sometimes. I don't know if y'all have done that on these, in these circles sometimes. Just allowing the sound. What is it? What's the sound of healing in your own body? It might be a song that you sing. To me, there's a kind of a humming coming up. I see this being comfortable with the truth of interdependence. I love that. Being comfortable with the truth of it. I'm amplifying it because I want to say this. I know there are people who, who find interdependence a fearful idea even though it's a reality. It's like, woo, that means that I'm connected to those people that could bring me down, or right? Or it can feel scary. Mm -hmm. Being comfortable with the truth of interdependence. 
can we feel our way into being comfortable in our bodies with I already belong. So what is the sound of healing like for you? The sound of that part of you that's already at ease. Can we allow space for that? So maybe we can close. We'll begin to bring our meditation to a close. I know we're going to do official closing and announcements in a few minutes. Let me see if there's a word or a phrase that's coming up that you haven't shared. Or how you might deepen your practices for feeling your inherent belonging, feeling the support of your ancestors. Those wisdom teachers that you know of, without whom you wouldn't be here those wisdom teachers who are in your circle right now. So pausing to invite, yeah, centering on a word, a phrase, an image, a sound. You wanna identify as a support for deepening your practices for healing and beginning again at this time. What's it like for you? Mm -hmm. Ring the bell and let us sit for a couple minutes in some silence. Yes. And if a word comes up that you want to share, humility beautiful in the chat while we're sitting, please do that. It's a chat that can, it's a pause that allows us to move. Chat, yes, yeah, soften. Ring the bell to invite an amplification of what's coming up for us in this moment. Yeah, self love. Yeah, resonance and harmony. Mm -hmm. Our original medicine and song. Acceptance. Hallelujah for that one, raising that up. Acceptance. We already belong. Can we receive that? Yeah, and it is okay to rest. Absolutely. Not only is it okay, rest is a form of resistance in an oppressive society. You have to rest. You have to make space for you. You absolutely must do that. It, whatever beginning again looks like, it needs to look like reclaiming. Reclaiming the magnitude of your being, magnificence of it. Rest in that sometimes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you are and for all that you're bringing. Just in making this commitment to create this space, this space for healing and beginning again. Thank you. <laughs>